Hello, everybody. It's TJ Schwartz and Lucas Burnley. You are listening to the Edge and Flow podcast, and we're excited today because we're talking about... Oh, have, we haven't said the name yet, have we? I don't know. I know the nothing. Knife, the knife that Lucas is designing for Schwartz Knives in this collaboration that we've talked about, formerly known as the Nova One, which was shelved, is yes. now a new design, which we, we talked about before. But do you want to say the name? Yeah, this is the turn. Spelling. T E R N, not T U R N. Specific. I, like I don't know why. I don't know why I like bird names so much. Mm-hmm. And is it is it an all caps thing or is it just? Uh, no, no, not an all caps. Okay. We can we can address that in okay. marketing. Yeah, yeah, we'll send it over right. to the marketing department. Yeah, send it to the marketing department. Have, have them do a uh, <laughs> what is it? A study group on it or whatever. <laughs> yeah, a little brainstorming. Mm-hmm. Right. See if we can achieve synchronicity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, that's my goal is. Design by committee on everything. That's my goal. <laughs> Dude, I, I've told you my, like the, ugh, I need to like break things down in my brain in a weird way. And I, when I would do design work, a lot of times I would leave the shop, go change my clothes and go in and I'd be a designer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I still change, like that. Change, change the vibration before you go do something different. Yeah. yeah. If no, I, I ever have it. a storefront, it's going to be me. Like <laughs> I'm going to be in the back. I'm going to be the janitor. Yeah, so he's gonna the, be like, "Hey, uh, is the owner around? I'm gonna go change. Like, yeah, come back. Hold on like, a second. Hey. I'll go get him. Yeah, I'll go get him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun. That is funny. <laughs> That's good. All right, but so I'm, we're gonna we're gonna talk turn. Uh, I'm, I'm hold- I want to know. I don't want to start there though. Can we not start there? Oh, we don't have to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to know how the new model's running. Oh, really good. Really, really good. So I it's running right now. So like out in the shop, Dalton's running the handles. And also the blades. So he's running both machines at once right now. And they're running really smooth. There wasn't, again, there wasn't a huge changeover from the Overland to the Overland Sport. Uh, building all the fixtures was obviously ground up, but it was, it's all the same feeds and speeds, pretty much all the same execution. Uh, the hardware is different, had to order different hardware, for shorter hardware. But other than that, it's cruising. And the sheath, we need to talk about that because we had a, we had, we left you on a, on a cliffhanger on the last episode about talking about sheath and Ooh. let's just to, talk about the sheath. Then. We're going to forget. So we, I developed it to be in pocket carry. Um, and, and one of the main differences with the sheath when approaching it that way was I wanted the waistline of the Kydex, sort of how high the Kydex came up on the handle yep. to be a little bit higher than what it is like on my Overland and confidant. Yep. You grab the knife in sheath and you're all the way choked up before you pull it. And I like that for a belt knife because it's just easier to get a, like you get a grip and you pull it and you don't regrip. Would you consider it, are you, you're considering it like a four finger grip? So you're like four fingers and you're pushing off with your thumb or yep. three fingers. Full, four fingers. F- like, okay. Four finger. Yeah. Like, so the overland and the confidant, I just, if you look at the sheath, it's scooped out where your four, your front finger would go. Mm-hmm. So you're not like hitting the sheath, pulling it and then scooting forward after you. Right. And so whereas the overland sport, that was going to be a problem if you actually wanted it down in your pocket because that edge is going to cut your pants wide open as soon as you pull the knife out. Right. And you're not actually able to get your hand all the way in your pocket anyway. So okay. the waistline on the sheath comes up higher. Um, yep. And so then with that, we, I was working on different methods for clipping it in your pocket. And I went with the Ulti clip for okay. the standard option um, and a little, little, I don't know, tidbit of, tidbit of information i did get set up as a dealer for the mini tech locks because i think i might offer those uh to help with people that did want a belt or horizontal carry it vertical or horizontal that's the um, beauty of kydex it is right like over the years i've used tech locks i've used mummer clips um i've used iwb loops which is kind of where i'm at now for the most part i really like the iwb loops um but the beauty is if you set your sheath up right you have all of the options Mm -hmm. and you pick what works well for your model in your mind. And then someone can just say like, well, that doesn't work for my application. I love that. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And the one, one thing I really hemmed and hawed on was whether it was going to be like a fold over taco style sheath or an actual pancake, like stacked sheath, you know, Mm -hmm. where'd you Um, end? So what's that? Where'd you end up? Uh, so it's the, it's the style that's two pieces of Kydex sandwich. Yep. I don't what, what would you call that? Like a that's pancake pancake. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fold Just, over and pancake. Right. And, I, and the reason I landed on it is if you are putting like a tech lock or something on it for horizontal, it really is kind of 
tough if it's the taco style it looks yep. kind of weird and it's just a weird angle yeah um and so i just it's more versatile and then the other thing was a nice thumb ramp is something i really like and you can add a thumb ramp to a taco style but when you add that i think the main reason to do the taco style is you can it's more room in your pocket for like your hand to still go in yeah but if you add a big thumb ramp to it you're kind of back to the square one you're kind right. of back to where you were so i was like yeah i'll just well, you get a less precise fit yeah Right. With, with, because you have, when you fold over, you theoretically have a straight line. Mm -hmm. You can get a little bit of variation in their curvature is, is usually fine. Mm -hmm. Um, your tip usually sits low, but when you start having like multiple feature heights and thicknesses, it just starts to kind of, yeah, kind of defeat the purpose yeah. of the simplicity of yeah. the fold over. And the Quiken, I, I have a, one of your custom Quikens right here yep. and I love the sheath on that, the fold over. Yep. It's the ideal knife for that. Totally. Because it's a straight back, yep. completely straight. Yep. That does um, ever that's like the that is the ideal scenario. And mm -hmm. the tip is high. Mm -hmm. So like if the Quiken was a spear point, it would still work just fine. But you start to have now you have like a secondary mold area that things can go wrong in. Yeah. That I think is really where the pancake starts to take yeah. over. Yeah. And and the other thing is I also have some gains because I'm CNC machining it. I, I basically, I've found out the exact tolerance of yep. how close the eyelets can get to the knife before they're going to start to go Ooh. onto the swell part of the sheath, if that makes sense. Yep. So my, my tolerances on that are really tight. And then the Kydex is only past the eyelets on the perimeter by like 40 thou or something. Yeah. So it's like, it's as small as you could physically make one while still having quarter inch eyelets. Yeah. So I would make the argument that your time in doing a fold over would so drastically be increased. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's like between not improving the function, the main, the main value of the foldovers is generally the, the, um, how narrow you can make it you, yeah. in general, you can make, make one a little bit narrower than a pancake, mm -hmm. but what you're doing, you're getting so close to that and it's so consistent. I, I think that even that as a gain would be so nominal. That's not worth right. it. Right. Yeah. So that's where we landed. And nice. so he's, he built, um, like we got together, built all the fixtures and, uh, I had him build like six or eight of them just to test fit on them to make sure we were all good. And the sheath design didn't need to change. And we did that before I launched it just so I was like, okay, this is what it's going to look like. Um, and it ended up working really nice. I, I I've been having fun cause I designed the, the sheath on all my models in CAD first, like it's completely CAD designed. And then we usually really don't have one in hand until we CNC machine one. Mm -hmm. um, I did hand make one for the Overland Sport to check a couple things, but in CAD it's kind of nice because like I can I can set outlines for like okay a tech lock a mini tech lock this clip that clip like I right. can have the eyelets exactly where they need to be for everything. Yep. Oh, I um, love that. So I tried to make it that way so that this, there's a three position location for the multi clip in depth. Yep. So I'll ship it in the middle position. You can go deeper or shallower. Oh, that's um, really cool. And then, yeah, pretty much anything. Honestly, I haven't, I've, I haven't really seen anything that wouldn't somehow fit on that sheath. Are ulti clips stainless? That's a good question. Uh, Curious. I'd have to, I'd have to look that up. Because I know they're they're blued, right? Either blued or black oxide. Blued I'd or, have black, to, or maybe yeah, black oxide. I I think you asked me that at, at Blade Show, and I looked at the package. I had one. Didn't on know. I, I didn't see I on there. Like it's funny. That's um, I haven't used a lot of ulti clips. I know people love them. Mm -hmm. Um, I just don't have a lot of experience with them. Yeah. Yeah. I think what, what leaned me towards it was I haven't carried in pocket knives like at all mm -hmm. and everyone on my other models, it's ulti clip, ulti clip. I get yeah. emails, messages, everyone, and they're unanimous almost with the ulti clip. And so I was like, well, I'm going to design this one for the ulti clip and carry yeah. it for a few days and see if I actually like it. And I like it. So nice. It's, it's a little bit like consumer led as far as. Oh, I got a I got a FedEx delivery from my nice. three year old here. Thank you, Delta. <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, good the last leg of the FedEx delivery <laughs> chain is my three year old carrying it into the office. Oh, I love it, man! Some, some carbide tooling. I'm trying to get the boys in the shop like weekly. Nice. Right now, um, I had Bo help me with Cypops, like an actual job, mm -hmm. and I loved it. And he loved it. And he worked for like an hour. Uh, I'm slowly working toward, I feel like we've talked about this a little bit, like slowly working towards adding them in some capacity to payroll. 
mm-hmm. so that I can do um, IRAs for them. Yeah. No, I, that's smart. I think I that's going to be, I don't know. I don't know like where and how to do that. It's kind of fun because like with Bo, he draws so much. Like I actually lately I've been like, oh, like maybe I'll do a stamp series for mm-hmm. him and then like mm-hmm. pay him a royalty. Mm-hmm. Um, or like in the shop work. And then there's also like there, the, 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 I guess what people would consider like the negative side probably is like, Oh, it's like marketing, right? Like you can like have your kids in like, like photos and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like I've, I've had my family so close in the business for the entire time that I don't really worry about. It's like, I just added a picture of Bo missing a tooth this morning to my yeah. feed. And I'm like, I don't think about it. Cause I'm yeah. like, Oh, it's just, I don't know. But yeah, it's newsworthy for sure. Kind of, kind of fun. So, yeah, that's uh, cool. shipping and handling. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. That, that, that's where she's at right now. We'll move <laughs> her up through the departments here soon. <laughs> I she, love has, it, yeah. she did sit next to my eyelet press one day and I just kind of said to her, I was like, Hey, nothing sharp around here. She's kind yep. of just playing with eyelet press and she pressed a bunch of eyelets, like just kind of while I wasn't paying attention and put them back in the eyelet bin. So now every once in a while I'll grab an <laughs> eyelet and it's already like curled over already flared. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. What did I, I, so I had Bo doing, um, before I tumble, I put, uh, re- like, um, removable zip ties on the, on like the small opening, the bottle cap opening to keep media from getting stuck and to, to stop the side pops from ringing together in the mm-hmm. tumbler. <clears throat> and I basically like, I just used it. I was like, Hey, here's the deal. Metal doesn't touch metal you go from left to right uh, and give me a count when you're done. And so just doing that, like watching him, like put the, put the loop on work from the top to the, you know, left to right, top to bottom and like very carefully go through it. I just realized like that's, that is being detail minded. Mm -hmm. That is as many times over the years as I've watched, like a customer at a knife show, pick up a knife and set it down on top of another knife. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this is just like a, actually a basic human skill that also, also may serve a purpose for us later down the road. You yeah. Know? The, the fundamentals. I mean, yeah. Just like situational yeah. awareness and like yeah. attention to detail. Yep. No, I, I really look forward to that there. She's just getting to that age for us. Uh, she's like I said, very, uh, you'd have to watch her close right now yeah. in the shop, but she is, she's getting, she's getting there. She's, yeah. I mean, Bo, to be fair, Bo is six. Mm hmm he's done a few things like maybe a few things when he's five Winston is hit or miss. He's, he's okay. Oh man. He just wants, he just wants all the machines. Mm-hmm. He just wants to be around it. And he, he gets like so energized that that is, <laughs> he's not there yet. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. They got to settle down their energy just a little bit when they're in the, in the shop, but it's hard, okay. man. That's hard. But, all right. Back on it. Uh, but yeah. The model's, the model's going really good. Cranking. Honestly, it's, I was having a conversation with that, with my dad about it. Like the problems I thought I would have over the, this few months of kind of scaling up. Cause kind of since January, I've kind of been in a mode of like scaling up and making things more efficient. And it yep. really feels like things came together. And the problems I thought I'd have are not the ones I'm having. I would say the problems I'm having right now are things are going so fast. Like production is so efficient that I'm like, I'm actually surprised that I guess, how do I put it? Like the amount of knives that are getting like stacked that are built on tables, there's not enough room for the knives to right. sit on tables, finished and sharpened. Cause like, we know you can't touch them against each other. So how do we have stackable bins for finished knives? Like how do, how do we ship them fast enough? Like it's, it's like the making of the knives feels like the part that's on lock right now, which isn't the part that I thought would feel on lock. Well, you know and this, I mean? this is the crazy thing, right? This is scale. Mm-hmm. This is, I don't want to say like, okay, like if you look at a mechanical system and you look at, you have to have a weakest link, like something's going to break, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what is it that breaks? This is like almost, I I feel like it's almost the opposite, but maybe, maybe it's actually just the same thing, Mm -hmm. which is like all of a sudden you have more horsepower. Yeah. Yeah. In one area. So I'm twisting my drive line now. Yeah. Yeah. You're just twisting your drive line. (laughs) I mean, it is in it. I would think and this is the stage that I've never made it to. Like we've gotten, we've increased areas of the business to a point where other areas are now are, have been uncomfortable Mm -hmm. where you're at. Seems like it will probably be a decent process, decently like long process of correcting 
Mm -hmm. those because you're, you're so efficient now at making, right. But you still have space limitations. Yes. Yeah, and manpower limitations, are, limitations. The space, the manpower doesn't feel too bad right now, I guess, because it's new, but the space is definitely starting yeah. to get to us. And it's not making the knives again. It's like, no. So I've got bins of knives that are getting machined. I've got ones that are heat treated. I've got ones that are getting lasered. And it's like, if you have that many knives in bins, that literally we're in a position where we don't know where to put the knives. It's not even like the tools yeah. or equipment. It's like, there's too many knives in this room. Yeah. Where do we put them? That's um, why companies have warehouses. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> legit, you're like, Oh, where do you keep the inventory? Yeah. You know, we hit like when, when we were cranking on Cape, it was just me and Joe in the shop, but we were making enough product that it, like Maddie being the only shipper, it started to like, all of a sudden it's like, we, we were, we've never had that much product before. Yeah. 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 Um, it's funny, man. I'm like, we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording. Um, I'm like on the other side of the spectrum, kind of, we're doing a lot of things. They're all, but it's all spread out. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the main focus for the last couple of years hasn't been in shop production as I'm starting to like come back over to producing more out of the shop, which is like the next like cycle. Um, I'm realizing that ultimately shops not fully set up. I'm pretty inefficient. The last two weeks I kind of let it go. And I was like, look for me to get efficient is actually like a pretty big jump. Like there's a bunch of systems that I have to upgrade. I have to like update models and fixturing and all this stuff. And it, I think again, like tying into this like ADHD stuff, I think there's so much that it's kind of giving me like analysis paralysis, almost like it's, I see the overall changes as opposed mm -hmm. to like making small systematic changes. So in the last couple of weeks I started to do that mm -hmm. and it's funny, man, some of these products that I've had for so long going back to them, it starts to like bring the process back into focus in a really familiar way. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I started working on quike and fixed blades and I had a bunch that were cut out and heat treated, but I just like, I saw, I was like, I'm not going to worry about like updating anything. I'm just going to work. And it's been awesome and super helpful. And That's it just, great. and it feels productive, just a different, it's like a different version. It's like productive at the scale and time we have right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And like you said, you kind of have to sink your teeth in something to, to optimize it. Like you have to yeah. be kind of doing it. It's like, yep. uh, the Toyota model, it's like continuous improvement. Yep. It's like, if you're only looking at it from a bird's eye view, it's, it's, it's like, it seems like a lot, like it seems like too much to handle. But right. If you're in it, you're like, I just need to get a little better at this, a little better at this. Okay. This was in my way. I need to move it. Okay. Yeah. This. Yeah. Well, and I think like even just looking at the Quikens from the stamp, like I've always just hand cut them mm -hmm. because they're so simple and that's how I started making them and they're really fast to do, but it's still time on a bandsaw, time on a drill press. And so I look at it and I'm like, instead of worrying about jumping all the way to, okay, the next Quikens I make, I need to like design fixturing. Uh, I'm going to have a water jet design fixturing uh, and then I'm going to figure out how to mill them, mill bevels. I realize like just having a batch water jet cut is like that 10% efficiency mm -hmm. and that's actually achievable. It's really easy, but it also starts to work towards the next goal, which is at the point that like, I'm sure I have the quite and fix blade in CAD somewhere, but like at the point that it's in CAD and I'm having them water jet, the step to having them water jet for fixturing is very small. Mm -hmm. Then I'm not having to do two things. I'm only having to design the fixture. Yep. And I think for a lot of my working career, I've worried so much about the end result that a lot of times I actually don't do the steps. Mm -hmm. So kind of new. It's like feels it feels like a kind of like a weird handicap of being like, I have to move very slowly, but if I move slowly, like it's that old adage, right? Like 
slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Yep. I feel like there's a lesson in there for me, which is like, look, if you move too fast, I'm going to get probably 10% of the things that I want to get done, but there's just going to be a huge amount that I actually can't get over that like initial hurdle Yeah. because I'm expecting like to do everything. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, I'm going to like dial infusion, get my, get fixturing made, do all this stuff. And it's like, uh, that's actually a month's worth of work or two months worth of work that I could break down, still be working efficiently. So it's kind of, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's weird having these like realizations that a lot of times around, uh, either weaknesses or limitations, but in that there is, there's like a lot of benefit, right? Because mm-hmm. once you realize like a weakness or limitation, you can work to like shore that up yeah, or find a solution that allows you to move forward. For sure. So, can, no, I agree completely. And I'm, I'm happy to see those Quike and fixed blades because you did that Quike and XL. Yeah. And that super thing, fun. I've never seen one because I know you used to make them, but yeah. I never, I never got to see one. And the thing is a mini sword, dude. It's like, dude, this is all kinds of, yeah. all kinds of attitude. Yeah. Right. It, it, yeah. In a self-defense situation, like you're going to win that one. Yeah. <laughs> Holes work really well. Yeah. yeah. You're going to, the... <laughs> you're going to see the blade on the other side, you know, like, geez, no, that's a, that's a cool, cool little. I think, I think knife. as like, as designers too, we have this, you see that you see things moving forward. And so a lot of times our, I think our brains are going, I need to do something new. I need to like, and we leave things behind. Posting the photo of that and seeing the comments and just like feedback on it. Like once again, like I realized I'm like, actually was a thing that I built demand for a long time ago that still exists Mm -hmm. and I still enjoy making them. Like why would I not keep making them? It also speaks to the kind of timelessness of that design. Sure. And you know what I mean? Like that's a, there, there are designs that are out there that like 10 years ago, if you went back and brought it to today. Right. I don't know if it would might have, not hold. I'm not saying your designs. I'm saying in general, in ge- like well, I've got if, them too. Like if it was a theme that was like hot back then, you know, right. there's like a more of a trendy theme. Whereas those Quikens like, dude, it, it could be 30 years old. It could be three years old. It could be yeah. from the future. Like it, it just works. It's a, it's, ba- a, it's a hard balance, like figuring out where, where to move past design or like, and this is a, this is an issue of scale too, right? Which is like in a small shop, a lot of times to do something new, you have to stop doing something else. Mm -hmm. Ideal world. I make, you know, like the Quike and Flipper, like it's great. I've made them for so long. Like there's a part of me that's like, "Ah, I could, I could easily stop making that model. But at the same time, I also realize that that's like, there's a entire collector base Mm -hmm. around that model. And like, I don't want to let it go. It's become a brand in itself. It's a brand in itself. It's like killing a business, not just a product. Yeah. And like arguments can be made on both sides of that conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is like, cause I, we've talked about this, which is like a lot of times when I sit down with like CRKT or Boker, I'll ask them like, Hey, what can we kill? Like Mm -hmm. what isn't performing well enough that we can remove from the line so that we can like figure out what is going to work better and we can move forward Mm -hmm. with custom work or like small batch work. I don't, I don't know if that like concept holds as well. Mm -hmm. And there's, I, I think the ability to like come back around, like it's okay to take a break from things and then like swing back around to them. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a great, point like on the nose for what I'm looking at because like I said things are moving so efficiently in the shop that there's right. projects I've killed that are now coming back yep pretty much they just are because we're just going to have the time to do them all of a sudden yeah. which the combs coming back for sure I just there's a few things I got to figure out and that scalpel plus like I think I will bring it back um, and that's exactly like there was six months ago if you'd asked me I'd be like I may never make those again like right. I may, they may be gone and now I'm looking at the situation, launch the Overland Sport, like all of the knives for the orders that were placed are going to be at heat treat by Tuesday and all the handles are going to be done. And by the end of next week, all the sheaths are going to be done. So it's like, we're just cruising. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're, we're doing more products, like as far as SKUs than what I originally thought, because I thought like maybe when I hire somebody like 
if I can just match my output, but then I get free to do right. some more stuff. That was kind of like what I was thinking. And the business model kind of was like aligned with my output. And then I, <laughs> it, it appears that our output, like as much as tripled, like in a month. And so it's like, I, now we have That's to diversify. Wild. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't a two time increase. You actually yeah. had like, it's a force multiplier. Yeah. Just because he's so focused. Like right. I, I can never focus like what he can with, like he can just do the work, you know, it's like right. a different experience for sure. So, but yeah. Where do you the, see, where do you see your next bottleneck? Like if you, this is fun. We can, cause we can like tangent off of this. So part of what I was talking about with like the Quikens was what I'm seeing is not not letting my brain run so far ahead in the planning process that I don't do the work. Mm -hmm. When we built this shop, I had a very similar experience, which was you can actually only plan so much of the work before you start actually you like a space, right? Like you, mm -hmm. I can only plan my shop so efficiently at a point you need to work in it. And I bet there's a 95% chance you're going to change it around. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a, like realizing where that point is, I think is pretty valuable. This ties into the turn conversation. Yeah, it does. But I want to know where, like, I want to know bottleneck as you're seeing it, like in stream. So the space is a thing, but we do have stackable bins. There is a, a couple spots in the shop for shelving. So it's yep. like, and that's just storage. Cause like worst case scenario, like we can start stacking things somewhere. I mean, that's not in the sure. way of production. You can use a storage facility for yeah. stuff that's not critical. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm not super worried about that, but that is one. Um, I would say one of the, I would say the biggest bottleneck right now is actually sales and sales have gone up since I started making knives like two years right. ago, like consistently, but my output was less than sales two months ago. And then triple the output. Now it's more than the sales because I don't have enough models to then just triple and right. immediately have that demand. Does that make sense? Yes. And so like, I'm like, okay, I need more points of interest in the brand and I need to become more of a marketing individual because I really haven't marketed stuff. Right. So I'm like now doing new designs is a lever that's that I can pull to like yep. put product in the shop. We make it and like, then we're selling it. And right. it's like, if what I was doing six months ago or three months ago was like, I was just making the Overland just nose down and right. it was like, Oh, more orders. Like I just got to try to keep up, couldn't keep up. And so it's just a different, my, my brain is having to switch like 180 in, in just a couple of weeks. So um, how do you, how do you address that? You know, cause there's, there's like, so there's a couple options, right? So you, you, you're producing more, you need to sell more. Mm -hmm. You need to open more sales channels. You need to generate more business. Do if you're doing more design, if you're having new models coming out, you're probably having to do less of that like legwork, right? Because the fact that you have new designs is selling more models than one model that is continually produced, mm -hmm. right? So the question that I would have would be, how do you pause or time new model releases with developing new sales channels? I'm staring at the ceiling as I'm like working this out on my yeah. fingers. Yeah. Um, or do you focus more on new product development and let some of the sales like happen organically or yeah. like what, what, what's your gut? Well, the, I keep thinking of like the metaphor of levers. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, I need some more knives. I, what levers can I pull to make that happen? One of them is retailers. Cause I, I get retailer inquiries like a lot. And for the last two years, I've just had to respond to everybody. Just can't do it. I'm behind on orders. If I get, right. if I get caught up, I'll let you know. Well, with triple the output, like all of a sudden, yeah, I could start selling more to retailers. Right. So that's a lever. It's not, I've been of the mindset that I don't want to like over utilize that. Yeah, but it's definitely something that sh that is valuable, yep. um, and so that's probably I might start selling more to retailers, um, and then also there is making uh, like new models, which is obviously yep. the obvious lever, which I just pulled with the Overland Sport, um, and then there is I mean all the different ways of marketing. There's like influencer marketing, there's email uh, list marketing. So I want to build a better email list. Um, 
there's like some kind of brand collaborate, like for example, with the, the turn that we're working on, like mm-hmm. more eyeballs, um, is kind right. of like the thing. Right. Uh, so cause you, cr- with that, you cross over some of my customer base into, well, and there's an interesting, there's an interesting process here too, which is <clears throat> on the mass production scale. I don't know how much our actual customer base transfers our visibility does transfer our names like give like some street cred to a new design inside Mm -hmm. of the industry but i would say on a like with your work i think that will translate directly to like my existing customer Mm -hmm. base because it's it's basically the same thing made in a different shop yeah it's very recognizable price point quality all of that so this, this will be an interesting test to see like one for one, does it, does it carry over more directly than it would on like mass yeah. production scale? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be that, more feelable, I guess. And, and that's, and that's one of the things, yeah, that I, that I agree with completely is like the turn when I saw it, I was like, I want to make that design because I love that knife mm-hmm. and I, and I want one of those to have like the Schwartz knives logo on it and, you know, have your name as the designer. Like that just sounds fun, mm-hmm. but like it is a lever to pull to do a brand collaboration to expand just overall visibility. You know what I mean? You know what I really want is now I want a board of levers and with, with labels. Yeah. So that you can pull like, all right, I'm going to push this lever and this lever. And those are my focuses for right now. Yeah. Dude, that'd be really fun. Sensory board. Okay. That's our new Kickstarter. No, that's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Just like with, with like little replaceable plaques that you change the name. It's an obsessive maker fidget toy. Yep. Yep. (laughs) 33 levers. Right. Can label them anything you want. That's awesome. Expandable. Expandable system. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's, that's great. Willy Wonka. I know. I don't know why that metaphor keeps sticking. I'm just obsessed with metaphors. It's really I think, good. But. Well, I, I told you like some of the, um, the coaching work I'm doing with Terrence, like we're doing similar things with scheduling mm-hmm. where he's like, you can't just make a schedule. You're like, your brain doesn't work like that. And your work doesn't really fit into it. And so we've created this system that like the last thing he phrased as was like a circuit board. And he's like, you're mm-hmm. essentially going to be connecting different, like different circuits Mm -hmm. to get to end results. And you need to realize that like, as long as the circuits are getting attached, you're working like that's, you're doing the right thing. You can't expect it to just be one connection all the time. Right. Okay. So now we're doing a circuit board and a lever board circuit and levers. Yep. (laughs) Kickstarter. If anyone lights up, if anyone's going to do that, I guess you can run with it, but just credit us. Yeah. Like this is the edge and flow circuit. Yeah. That's a dopamine board. Right. Like a little light bulb and a sound ding. Yeah. Ding. Okay. All of that talking turn, we were talking blade length and here's where this carries over into this conversation. Uh, the big question that we were talking about is as is the turn might be slightly long for an in pocket carry. However, the proportions of the turn are really, really nice as is. Mm -hmm. We were debating reducing the blade size so that it would fit as an in pocket knife. And here's my thought. I think Mm -hmm. the design is solid. I actually think you just released an in pocket knife. Mm -hmm. I think not overthinking going with the design and if there's overwhelming demand moving forward for an in-pocket version, we make a correction. Mm -hmm. That's my gut as opposed to changing the model that we both like to fit inside of a category that it wasn't necessarily intended for. Mm -hmm. What do you think? No, I agree. And that's a great point that I just brought out the in pocket Overland Sport. Yep. And the other thing that I noticed about the Ulti clip and one of the selling points on it for me was because it grabs, it's like yep. a cam, you know, it locks. Uh, the ability to put it into pockets that aren't normally intended to hold things like that yeah. is awesome. So, for example, um, like if you had like a purse that has an inner pocket yep. that has 
like maybe it's even a zipper pocket or something. Yep. That's like a real thin, just light fabric, like a pocket clip of most kinds are not going to really grab on that. You can clip it like inside the purse and then yep. when you pull the knife, it draws. And so the Ulti clip on this knife would be awesome from like a backpacking standpoint, which is what we're kind of targeting in that backpacks always have like all those little pouches on the outside. Yep. And it's like, instead of strapping it on the outside, have like a lot of depictions of it. So people understand the concept of like the Ulti clip. If you have deep enough pockets, will work, make this knife work for in pocket. But look in pocket doesn't just mean on your pants, like right. in your water bottle pocket, in the outside right. pouch, in the inside pouch, you know, yep. um, and the Ulti clip just does great with that. So it might still be that an option is the Ulti clip. Yeah. And then I think we, that's, I think that's the way to go. The other, the other thing is, man, I don't know. Like there, there are, uh, we know that pocket carry is going to increase the demand on any model. There is a part of me that doesn't want to have to be held to certain parameters when I design, mm-hmm. because I feel like that limitation is exactly that. It's not that it doesn't make it better, but it's really easy for me to start doing it to where I'm like, this is the next in pocket and the next in pocket. And I don't want my brain to work that way. Sometimes mm-hmm. I just want to design the thing that I like mm-hmm. and see if other people like it too. No. And this, uh, honestly, a hunting knife and or backpacking. And I, I understand that you people listening haven't seen this yet and we will change that at some <laughs> point. So uh, my apologies, but yeah, as a hunting knife, as a backpacking knife, it's like, it has an outdoor vibe, but it doesn't look anything like the stuff that I'm making. And that's what I like so much about this. And the size is very akin to true outdoorsman use, as opposed right. to like, if you go so small for the in pocket, like the scalpel plus, I'm like, it kind of, one of the reasons why I was always iffy on it is like it sold well. It's probably the hottest model I've ever launched as far as feedback, but it's just like, what are you going to do with that outdoors? It's not an outdoors right. knife. This is an outdoors knife when I look at it. So it's like pretty, it's um, like fairly refined. I think you yeah. and I talking about this, why without seeing pictures yet, I think a fun like conversation is our brands exist in two different spaces inside of the knife industry but we actually have a lot of crossover on a personal level of like what interests us. Mm -hmm. Right. So you do outdoor focused knives with a lot of actually like very modern, uh, design language. I tend to do like more like what I guess, like what you consider like urban, like EDC stuff, Mm -hmm. but I actually like a lot of really classic design language. I feel like the turn hits this point for us where it's like, it actually is a true crossover. Yeah. No one would notice either way. If you're like using this in camp or having it like, you know, in your pocket yeah, in your laptop bag, like it it blends pretty seamlessly. Yeah. And I did something just popped in my head. That's funny. You you keep talking about post tactical, how you're in post tactical. I'm kind of in like post bushcraft or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) you know what these, I mean, the phrases are fun, like and labeling things for me is fun because it gives you, it just gives you a frame of reference to explain to yourself what you are doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really fun. It's not trying to complicate genres for, for me, like I'm not trying to complicate it for other people and I don't expect other people to like attach to a concept. But for me, it's like, it's almost like hashtags. It's like, it helps me categorize like what type of work this is and where it fits in. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, and I like it because it's like, I think a, a, a good, uh, presentation of your brand to the customer as like a homogenous group of products Mm -hmm. is just smart. And so even if it's not necessarily the boundaries of what you are interested in, but it's sort of a boundary of like, this isn't going to confuse my customer if I can stay in this very wide lane. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, and, and it's like, obviously you can, you can break rules once you set them up intentionally right. for fun, right. but having a general like brand output that is just people understand what you're trying to do. They know if you're going to announce a new product, it's probably going to work for them if the last few things they bought from you worked for them. Because you're just like in a, in some way, like in a single vein, you know what I mean? Right. Like thematic in terms of the brand. 
Um, I've I always like struggled with that so much. Like I have never felt like a cohesive brand and it's cause I have broad interests, but on a brand standpoint, it's actually difficult, mm-hmm. right? Like there's, I don't know that there's continuity in models. I don't, I mean, even some, but like some of it is by design, like the whole idea behind Burnley brand was that it didn't have to be mm-hmm. anything like mm-hmm. the, the, just the logo type was made to be used in different fonts. And the example that I always give is like in a line at a trade show and you see like, you know, your traditional like trucker cap on one guy and a five panel camp hat on someone else. Their entire style is different, but they're mm-hmm. wearing the same brand. Yeah. And I love that. Mm-hmm. I still haven't figured out how to like t- make that cohesive in products. Like the apparel yeah. side, it's actually much easier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I guess what I'd say is I try to use a wide swath when I'm yeah. doing that, like thematic approach. I guess the yeah. outdoors thing, just because, yeah. like you said, you've got, uh, you're right, not being overly narrow and not like, trimming your wings before you even get off the ground is right. probably really smart. But even if you sure. look, if you look at the turn, if we ever decide to do a scaled version, the lines and design language on this knife, it's going to be a more contoured scale. There's mm-hmm. going to be different usage of like curvature mm-hmm. that in my mind almost starts a new line of work where you have one model. Now you're like, okay, this model, I have these, which have this design language. And then over here we have this model. Mm-hmm. And you're like that models by itself in, I guess like overarching for me, the thought it's almost like inside of our brand. It's almost like different businesses where I'm like, Oh, like, okay, here's this, like, uh, like the Japanese work, right? Like the, the Quikins and stuff. I'm like, that's like, that's a genre of knife. Where do oyster knives fit into that? Okay. Well, mm-hmm. oyster, oyster knives are culinary knives. But if it's just by itself, it's nothing. As soon as you start to add more knives, I'm like, oh, then there's branding that can happen around that. And so it's like these different little little side entities mm-hmm. kind of like develop. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. But needless you know? to say, dude, I'm excited to make this thing. My Me only too. fear with it is it's long and thin and just yeah. making sure we stay straight and flat. Um, yeah. That's the only fear I have. I don't think it's going to be a big problem because I haven't had those issues, but it's something I'm going to be weary of and I'm going to do small batch and slowly ramp up because I don't want too many knives that heat treat at once yeah. and run into a, a roadblock there. But the scalpel, those little scalpel plus knives, they're, they're short and stubby, but I actually mill out all of the strength when I go and do all those pockets. Right. And I did many of those and they stayed very straight. Um, I'm pretty so, curious this because the tip on this is pretty fine. Yeah. I'm really curious to see Yeah, that. So for me, that's where I start to look at my interchanges again. If we realize that because of the length or some other feature in this, that it's not working inside of your manufacturing process, I think that's where we readdress and start to look at like, Oh, okay. Does it work if we shorten it is Mm -hmm. out of curiosity because this is thinner is hard milling. Is it an option or is it off the table? The problem I have is if it's magna cut, right? It's pretty much demanded in the market to go to 64 Rockwell. Yeah. Um, That's insanity. And, and so that's where I, that's where I'm at on my knives. And if it hard milling, I'm fine with, cause I had, I hard milled a bunch of nitro V and it was like 60 Rockwell. And it worked. And then I, I did hard mill Magna cut and it was like, I was at like 62 at that time with that Magna cut and it would just obliterated tools. Like, I mean, we're talking crush yeah. them and yeah, the problem, that's been pretty much not debatable. And the, the problem I had with it was <clears throat> that like my, the shape of my plunge is partly yep. uh, created by the corner round of the bull nose end mill that I use. Yep. And that bull nose would get a flat spot on it yeah. almost immediately. And then you would get a little rib in the plunge. So even if it was still milling and like surviving just enough to cut, you'd get your plunge all jacked up like real bad, even just in one knife. Starts so, to move into CBN territory. Yeah. And so if if I do want to go into CBN grinding on these, and that's that's on the to-do list, probably not in the near future, but I do think 
for me, I don't know that the milling, the bevel makes that big of a difference on it staying straight because I think whatever it is that's the, that's there, that's causing knives to not be straight. I don't think it's because of the bevel. I think it's in the steel itself. And the reason I think that is I've done like hundreds of overlands, <clears throat> excuse me, that had bevels. And I would see like the tiniest little, like in the, in a stack of 10 of them, right? Like tiniest little, little bit of light going through, you know, just where there's a little bit of lack of straightness. You're talking pre heat treat or after, post after. after. Okay. And I, and I did 200 confidants in one batch that I sent to heat treat without bevels. Cause I had tactile grind them. And I was curious, I was like, are these, are these going to be pretty much the same? And it was like basically the same exact result with and without the bevel. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of a, a few hundred knives over that much data, like it just seems like it didn't make a difference whether it had a bevel or not. Well, I mean, that's like the stress relieving. I would yeah, always want to know more about metallurgy and I mm -hmm. do the same thing. Like basically I research deeply and then I forget most of it and I work from lists. So like when I'm working, mm -hmm. when I'm working uh, with steels, I've got the, like essentially like the heat treat recipes mm -hmm. that are, that I'm working with that are consistent, that are developed, but I'm not enough of a metallurgist to like know yeah. certain critical elements. And that's one that I've always wondered is like, okay, with, with stainlesses, like does a stress relieving cycle pre heat treat, like post say post milling, right. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Does that happen in like your standard soak time? Like where, where is that? Because I still maintain that the results you're getting are like uncannily good. Mm. I would say that like most knife makers, if you ask them what you were doing, if you're like, here's how I'm going to make a knife. I bet nine out of 10 would tell you that it won't work. So you're proving that it's working at right. scale. It's not working on one knife. It's working on hundreds. Mm-hmm. And I bet you would still have non-blade people be like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Just one no, of these I've, days. I've had that conversation for sure. Yeah. Um, and, but I, I think there's, there's a few nuances to it. Just, I, I'm not an expert and I'm not a metallurgist either. I just, I have enough data of seeing knives get made to know a little bit, but again, a little bit. Uh, but it seems like I, in, in my opinion, it seems like the steel has stress in it when it's rolled, hot rolled um, as a sheet. And the reason I think that is when you cut it in a water jet, some of totally. them bounce out of straight. Yep. And what I found is if you, if you machine them, um, and like straighten them out, like manually when they're soft, yep. they will go, they will go back to where they were. So like yep. manually straightening it out, preheat treat doesn't really accomplish anything Yep. because it'll, it'll, it'll keep the memory. And then when you heat it up to 2000 degrees, it'll go right back. Um, and so it seems like when you mill the bevels, if there's a lot of stress, in the in the steel itself what's causing it to warp isn't necessarily the stress from milling the bevel but the stress in the steel is now less arrested does that make sense yeah and so when you heat treat it if, if you're getting warping it might be that it's the steel itself that is being weakened by having right. a bevel um because it's just i just haven't had warping issues with like my bevels it just isn't so really it's problem. super interesting like when we first started working with AEBL, mm -hmm. I'd never had so many problems with warping as I did with AEBL. And it took us a little while to figure out a process. When we did, we stopped having problems. Mm -hmm. That might be one where like either this, like a soak time changed or something. And I just, again, these are questions that I don't run into the problem that often. Mm -hmm. And at scale, I would love to know the answer for, okay. uh, totally just a thought plug for something related, which is, um, Laren Thomas just released a new book, um, history, called of knife the, Sto steel. the story of knife steel, the story of knife steel. Okay. Um, I've got his, I've got his other book too, and it's awesome and super heady mm -hmm. and like way above my like ability to understand. Yeah but it's rad to go in and be able to pick out elements or like know about certain yeah. steels. Look at charts uh, and stuff. Story of knife steel is, uh, I haven't read it yet, but I, I got to check it out at blade a little bit, um, is essentially, I think more of a history and like the backstory of some of the common steels that we're using. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm excited to check it out. Yeah, no, that I have his other book too. And it is actually where I've 
if I talk about knife steels, like in a very specific way, it's yeah. probably knowledge that I picked up from that book. Yeah. Again, it's like, if you're going to read the whole thing through, like you better be in a pretty scholarly mood. Yeah. But if, but <laughs> if you just want to say like, what's nitro V like compared to yeah. 3V in terms of toughness, like, and you want to flip to that page and start to look at some charts, like it's really good for as reference material. Yeah. And well, so and that, Laren, I, this was the first time I'd ever actually met Laren. I've known his dad, um, for a long time. And like, this is, I don't know. It's like about as honest of a lineage and like steel mm-hmm. as you could possibly yeah, come from. But is. Laren is responsible for Magna Cut. Yeah. Right. So he mm-hmm. literally brought a new steel to market. Mm-hmm. That's and and yeah. he's a, he's arguably at this point people are you know pretty impressed with this yeah. as a yeah. as an ultimate steel. He, he is a very uh, intelligent individual. I did yeah. talk to him one time in person, <laughs> and yeah, he's he's knowledgeable. Yeah. He's, and he's ready to talk about steel pretty much whenever, at least it seemed like. Yeah. Super, super nice guy. I like met him just leaving the, um, the, the hall of fame, uh, man, I cannot, for some reason, the word like doesn't stick. What is it? Knife Not inauguration. Uh, induction. Induction. My God. <laughs> induction <laughs> forging. Is... I'll remember it. Um, yeah. So story of nice steel. I check it out. I before I would be remiss not to give a lot of credit to my heat treater though. They're Seriously. so good at heat treating these things. It is like is unbelievable. So the fact that the straightness is coming through, like all these things I'm saying about the steel and the bevel and all that, they are doing fixturing for the tempering part of it and the way that the temperatures oh. that they're running. So like these are tempered clamped individually. Like they have like aluminum plates and they bolt them all down and then they temper them. And so they're Wait, drawing. So they're tempered. So like, okay, a lot of us do plate quenching. Yeah, these are so they're these doing are air plate quenched. temp. They're air quenched and plate tempered. Plate tempered. Dude, yeah. I'm so curious. Uh, so have you like run this by them and been like, hey, here's the deal: the results we're getting are weird. <laughs> right. Why are you getting such a good result? Can you just ask them that? Uh. Well, the thing is, I do know one other thing about their process, but I actually am a little worried about saying it because don't I don't say it. I, I, I just want to. Right. There is w- one part of the process that I think might be linked to this success, but all I can say is ASCO Manufacturing. They do all of Chris Reeves' stuff. They do my stuff. They do pretty much all the high end Idaho knives. So it's like, and they're a, uh, a industrial knife blade manufacturer for like food processing plants. Oh. So like if you're making like ground pork in your factory right. and you have this crazy special machine that you need custom blades for, then they make the blade, they heat treat it. And so they do blades that are like 30 thou thick that are like 40 inches long. Right. That and have so to they, be perfect. That's just how they, they just, they know. Dude, I love how, it. Yeah. I love it. There's so, so many things that people will tell you like won't work or can't work. And it's just that they haven't made it work. Mm -hmm. That is, it's amazing. And the other thing I like about the bevels too, is when you're air quenching, like in a, in a vacuum furnace is the, uh, I mean, I I guess I shouldn't speak how to turn in theory, the, uh, like you've heard of retained Austinite. It's Mm -hmm. like the faster you bring it down on a quench, the more retained Austinite you have, thus better performance. My edge is like, you know, 10 to 14 thou, depending on the model the edge of the knife is getting quenched probably is faster than any other part of the knife and sure. faster than it would have been if it was full thickness. So I'm, I'm just like, I kind of believe that I probably have a, a like a maximum performance advantage of, of retained austenite, like close to the edge, because it's like, you can't get it quenched any faster than if it's only 10 thou thick. Cause it's, you know, it's going to go That's really fast. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. See, it's like one more thing. Like it's yeah. an area where like a specialist is, pretty yeah. cool <laughs> but i i like again i should say like none of this is gospel like i don't know i don't know anything about this stuff and i've a... heard they have all their uh their furnaces facing north so like you know that's yeah pretty cool. yeah <laughs> right right they, they they do the sage cleanse you know yeah once a week. they only they only quench on full mint yeah so yeah. i mean makes a know, difference call it call it a trade secret yeah. but right. <laughs> dude okay pretty exciting so we're gonna see if the turn can be heat treated where where are we at on it what are we doing? What conversations so, do we have to have around it? So the Overland Sport, I had two sheets sitting ready that could be the turn or the Overland Sport. I cut the first sheet to the Overland Sport. I was really happy with sales. So the second sheet is also becoming Overland Sports. Nice. But it, it was waiting in the wings in case, like if if, it, if I didn't need steel immediately for more Overland Sports, but I I do. 
So I'm ordering new steel for this, which I actually preferred. And the reason being is another little issue I see coming is the longer and thinner and uh, apart is for uh, surface grinding, the harder it is to get it to lay flat on a magnet and then flip uh, multiple times. Cause my yep. uh, Ron was telling me that my Overland sport is easier to surface grind than like the confidant. Sure. Even though they're the same steel and the same, same starting and finishing thickness, right. but the rigidity of the shorter knife makes it easier to surface grind. Totally. So this is going to be a, a like, wet noodle oh um, boy and so what i want to do is i want to order the steel and have it blanchard ground as a full sheet yep. to like five to eight thou over and then have it surface ground so that he has flat like mirror finishes for the magnet to get a hold of and to hold it flat um and those sheets that i had here were not blanchard ground and i was actually worried about yeah, giving him sense. a bunch of these water jet out of full thickness and him yep. having issues so it's going to work out for the best, but I digress. I'm going to order steel for this once we have the design finalized. So if mm -hmm. we do agree that this length is what we want, we are like very close to probably getting steel on the way. Um, and I, I would say not to like backtrack. I would say a blade length there up to maybe a quarter of an inch shorter is not a noticeable change. Mm-hmm. Visually, mm -hmm. I kind of feel like that. Do I have one around? Do you, how about this for homework? If okay. you move that on the shorter side from where it is to where you feel like it hasn't diverged from the overall balance and we'll start with that and we'll see if we like it. So you, you do like, you like the concept of slightly shorter, slightly shorter, maybe, but I would have to see it. Okay. Here's another question. Slightly shorter is an option. The tip on this specific version of the turn is very fine. Mm -hmm. We could also slightly modify like the curvature of the spine to reinforce the tip slightly more. I, I kind of want to go full send on it. Yeah. And okay. just, and just see, because just I see. haven't, I just haven't had heat treat issues. And so. Okay. How far can we push that? Well, and I'm, I'm even just thinking about this just from just from the standpoint of the design. Like it's that's mm. the balance point, right? Like what you have now, it's a it's a very fine point. Mm -hmm. So it's I like, like do you want to beef it up slightly? No, I've got start here. All, all my knives have beefy tips, every single one right now. So this is a nice. So this is the keenest tip that I would produce yet. So it might be wise to do I that. I think. I'm, yeah, I like it I the way it is. That. If you like the size and the length. I say we run. I say it's go time. I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to hand grind this 3D printed. <laughs> I have done sample it. and be like, this is the length I want. Right. Yeah. Or OK, I'll you. play with it. I'll, okay. Basically, what I'll do is I'll just tweak. I feel yeah, I feel like if anything, it's somewhere between an eighth and a quarter of an inch yeah. off. And it's so minor. That this is definitely like this is definitely like a designer only element. <laughs> like yeah. I don't think anyone's going to notice. Yeah. But ne needless to say, or I guess we're, we're eighth inch, is that what we're going with? Like if I'm going to order steel. Yeah. I think, I think eighth inch is the move. Okay. Um, so I would, I'll probably have, a, I'm going to figure out what their Blanchard grinding tolerance is on a full sheet and probably get something Blanchard ground. Into you this. could, you could be slightly over eighth. Because this is actually, I mean, it's a, it's a real knife. It feels like with a tall grind, I mean, ah, oh man, it's really hard. Do you like the 3d print when you look at it? Is gonna, it thick enough for you? I'm going to compare it. So the Overland Sport is 130. Yeah. We're talking about 5,000s difference. And yet somehow that actually makes a difference. It, it does. So the, the bevel height is this is only marginally higher than my overland sport yep it's pretty much effectively the same though it's really close and if it was the same thickness let me dwell on that because i have the overland sport in my pocket right now and it yep. would be a similar geometry to that i feel like gut response is i would go 130 just for material consistency 
because then you're not having to have like multiple material thicknesses for a model. You're just reducing mm-hmm. potential for error. You're yeah. also, if you have some steel and you're like, oh man, like I actually really need to yeah. do something else with it. You can do that, especially yeah. if you're having it blanch or gum. I say go 130. Yeah. 130. Yep. I agree. Okay. That's smart. Um, Sweet, man. Yeah. How's no, everything I'm- else going? Oh, good, dude. Today's my wife and I's anniversary, actually. So happy anniversary. How many years? Four years. Dude. Yeah. It's exciting. How old is Delta? Three. Three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She's towards the beginning there. Dude. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. I had, I had Dalton. Dalton's a ring maker. I had her, him make her a ring. Like I, I traded him some, some nice stuff and got a fancy ring for her for the anniversary. So. I love it, man. Yeah. Well done. No, well, thanks. How about you? How things going? Uh, things are good, man. Um, Bo just graduated uh, pre-K mm. yesterday, which uh, feels weird, man. He's like, that's like kind of a big deal. We went he's, to graduation. He's a real like, boy. He's like a real boy. The d- same <laughs> yeah. day he lost a tooth, one of his front teeth. Yeah. So he's looking like, you know, buckwheat. And- right. That's awesome. Wearing a Spider-Man costume. That's so good. But yeah, man, it's just, it's crazy. Like everybody says like, you know, days are long, but the years are short. And like these, these moments where you're like, oh wow. Yeah. Like he's getting ready. He's getting ready to go to kindergarten in the fall. Mm-hmm. Like that's crazy. Yeah. I like, no, just got to con- enjoy awesome. it. Congrats to him. Yeah, man. Yeah. We're, uh, we're headed up for a little father's day weekend in the mountains and nice like mix of father's day slash anniversary weekend. So nice tomorrow I'll be out of the shop and, Oh, I forgot to say we last week, I'll just do this real quick. We were going to do my, our downshift Dalton and oh, I yeah. on Monday. Yep. Um, because my wife and I decided to go to the mountains Friday, which is tomorrow. Uh, I was like, Friday will be my downshift and I give him his own downshift while I'm gone. Nice. So tomorrow I, I kind of explained to him the whole premise and yep. he said he's going to drive to this little mountain town called McCall and he's going to get lunch on his motorcycle. Um, and that's what he's doing tomorrow. So I love it, man. I'll, he gets I can, it. I can ask him to report back on the downshift <laughs> experience. To. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Curious yeah. to hear how it goes. Yeah. All right, man. Um, cool. Let's call it Uh happy father's day. Happy anniversary. Yep. Thank you uh, to all you guys listening. Happy father's day. You're doing a good job. Appreciate y'all. Yep. You guys have a good one. Guys, take it easy. Peace.